often referred to as the world's greatest con man, Victor Lustig used his abundant charm, wit and unscrupulous nature to swindle his unsuspecting victims in order to live the high life. This was a man who once sold France's iconic Eiffel Tower and pulled a con on Al Capone, the Chicago Mafia boss. This is a peek into the life of one of the most audacious crooks of all time. Victor Lustig was born in 1890 in what was then Austria-Hungary, which today is part of the Czech Republic. He was by all accounts a brilliant student. Academically gifted, he was able to speak five languages fluently. However, instead of using his natural talents in the world of legitimate business, Victor was drawn to a life of crime, and for him this meant swindling. His criminal career began on the steamship routes between Europe and America. This was the golden age of the luxurious steam liners, and Lustig had no problem in finding wealthy passengers to engage with. He would often pass himself off as a Broadway producer looking for backers for his next surefire Broadway smash. Needless to say, once the ship had arrived in port, the producer would mysteriously vanish, along with any secured funds. With the outbreak of World War I leading to a suspension of the transatlantic passenger liners, Lustig began to cast around for new opportunities in the world of the con man, and it was in 1925, whilst in Paris, that he hit upon his now infamous Eiffel Tower scheme. Having read a newspaper story about the rusting Eiffel Tower and the high cost of its maintenance and repairs, it was now that Lustig devised the plan that would make him a legend in the history of con men. Lustig always went about planning a con with plenty of research and attention to detail, and this time was no exception. He found the largest metal scrap dealers in Paris, and having found a willing forger to provide him with official looking stationery, he sent out to them a vague but tantalising letter. He claimed to be the deputy director of the Ministère de Poste du Telegraphe, and he was requesting a meeting that might prove lucrative. The only condition was absolute discretion on their part. Now the idea of selling the Eiffel Tower may seem absurd to us today, but at the time it may not have been as outlandish as one might suppose. The tower had been built for the 1889 Paris International Exposition, part of a grand fair showcasing the engineering innovations of the era, but it was never meant to be permanent. The original lifespan of the structure was only given as 20 years, and this deadline had already passed, and coupled with the high maintenance costs and the sight of the now rusting tower, this all made for a convincing proposition, which Lustig would expertly pitch to his unsuspecting marks. Having booked a private room at the upmarket and expensive Hôtel du Crillon, Lustig lured in his prospective dupes. After first treating the scrap dealers to a fine dinner and plenty of wine, Lustig then gave them his emotional speech, mournfully admitting that there was no other option and that the tower was to be sold for scrap. The 7,000 tonnes of scrap iron would be sold to the highest bidder. After the dinner, the men were chauffeured to the tower itself, where Lustig used a fake ID to gain entrance and got past a maintenance crew. He was able to whisk his trusting guests up to the top of the tower and gave them the finest view in the city. During this meeting, Lustig was carefully observing the dealers, sizing up the man he thought would be the easiest to convince. He settled on a certain André Poisson, a man new to the city, who seemed eager to impress his peers. A few days later, Poisson was invited to a follow-up meeting where Lustig appeared to take him into his confidence. Lustig explained that he was only a middle-ranking official and his salary was not consummate with the pressures on him to manage the sale. It was clear to Poisson that Lustig was asking for a bribe in order to secure the winning bid. Rather than being shocked, this bold move by Lustig convinced Poisson that the deal was genuine. The ruse worked. Poisson had been hooked. Believing that his chance to enter Parisian society and fame had come, Poisson agreed and quickly paid the winning bid amount plus a hefty bribe to boot. Within the hour, Lustig was on his way to Austria. Over the next few weeks, he scanned the newspapers for any news of the scam, but he found none. His hunch had been right. Poisson had been too embarrassed to go to the police, and Lustig was in the clear. 
he returned to Paris to try the con one more time. But this time, he suspected one of the dealers had tipped to his scheme and informed the police, whereupon Lustig fled to the United States. Whilst in Chicago, Lustig pulled a scam on the infamous Chicago Mafia boss Al Capone. Lustig persuaded Capone to front him $50,000, pretending he had some crooked scheme set up which was going to make them a lot of money. In reality, Lustig didn't do anything with the money, he just kept it in his hotel safe for a couple of months. He then returned to Capone, spinning him a yarn about how the scheme had fallen through and apologising for wasting his time. This was incredibly risky, as Capone was notorious for his violent temper, but Lustig had got it all planned out. Before things got out of hand, he smoothly returned all the money he'd borrowed. Capone, relieved that he hadn't been conned, rewarded Lustig with $5,000 for his honesty. Not only had Lustig just pulled a fast one on Capone and gotten away with it, but the mob boss now trusted him to boot. Think what you might about Lustig and his criminal ways, but you can't deny the guy certainly had some balls. In 1930, Lustig went into partnership with a Nebraska chemist named Tom Shaw, and the two men began a counterfeiting operation using plates, paper and ink that emulated the tiny red and green threads in real dollar bills. They set up an elaborate distribution system to push out more than $100,000 per month using couriers who didn't even know that they were dealing with counterfeit money. The months passed. More and more phony bills kept turning up at banks and racetracks. The amount was now getting into the millions, and the hunt was on, as the amount of so-called lustig money entering circulation was worrying officials who thought it could easily disrupt the actual US money supply. Lustig was eventually caught in 1935, caught out not by the ingenuity of the FBI, but instead by the duplicity of his girlfriend, Billy May. She suspected Lustig of cheating on her, and in a fit of pique, she informed the police of his whereabouts. Not one to be brought line at the first sign of trouble, Lustig promptly escaped. On the day before his trial was to begin, dressed in prison-issue dungarees and slippers, he tied several bedsheets into a rope and slipped out of the window of the Federal Detention Headquarters in Lower Manhattan. Pretending to be a window cleaner, he casually wiped at the windows as he shimmied down the building. Once at street level, he vanished. A month later, he was caught again, but this time there was to be no escape. He was sentenced to 20 years in Alcatraz prison. He died of pneumonia in 1947 while still incarcerated. His death certificate gives his occupation as apprentice salesman. For anyone out there looking to follow in Lustig's footsteps, he handily left what he called the Ten Commandments for Con Men, a set of tips for aspiring con artists to follow. Perhaps Lustig's legacy lives on today. Maybe out there somewhere is a con man greater than Lustig, and if he's that good, we'll probably never know. Because he'll probably never be caught.